welcome to episode 14 of .NET Concept of the Week, where I explain a concept related to .NET programming every week in a short video. This time we are going to talk about exception filters in C Sharp. Let's start with the syntax. Since C Sharp 6, after the catch block, we can use the when keyword, and with this we can say that we only want to catch exceptions which have BAM in their message property. This here is of course completely made up and I don't think that you want to filter exceptions based on the message BAM, but for our discussion, this is fine. A more real world use case could be a custom exception class with some properties and filtering these custom exceptions based on the values stored in those properties. Alright, so this one here is an exception filter and when an exception within this call is thrown with the message BAM, then we catch it Otherwise, the exception will bubble to the main method and then eventually the program will terminate with an unhandled exception. Now you may think that this is just a syntactic sugar and we could also write a simple catch block and if the exception message is BAM, then we do the same as before, otherwise we rethrow the exception. Now these two aren't the same. The behavior in both cases is very similar. If the exception message is BAM, then we print BAM exception to the console, otherwise we let the exception bubble up to the main method. Now let's see the compiled code to understand the difference. I open the compiled code in IELDASM, first let's look at the method with the plain catch block. Nothing unexpected here, we have a try block, within this try block we call our method that throws an exception and for this try block we also have a catch block. Within this catch block we have our string comparison and if the string matches to BAM, then we call console.writeLine and we otherwise rethrow the exception. Now let's take a look at the other method with the exception filter. We have our try block here and after that we have a filter block and after that we have a catch block. This filter block compares the exception message to the string and if this comparison returns true, then the catch block is executed. The main difference is that in this case we don't enter the catch block if the filter returns false which in this case means that the exception message isn't BAM. So this means that the exception filter syntax in C Sharp isn't just the syntactic sugar, the part after the when keyword is compiled into an exception filter and with that we can decide whether the catch block should be entered or not. Now this exception filter mechanism that we see in the IL code was already available in the first CLR version. In fact, in Visual Basic you could already use this exception filter and generate this IL code, but in C Sharp this was only introduced in version 6. What we look at here is the ECMAS 335 standard, which defines the common language infrastructure. This document basically describes what IL code is valid and what the CLR does with specific IL instructions. And this part here defines the filter block that we saw in our IL code. Keep in mind that this document doesn't talk about C Sharp, this talks about the IL code that the C Sharp code compiles to and like I said, this was already here in the first version of this document. Now we understand what these when blocks compile to, now let's see what this means in practice. For this, let's look at another use case where exception filters are very useful. Let's say we want to log exceptions, we don't want to catch them or do anything with them, we simply want to log them. This typically can be a logging framework which simply wants to log exceptions. To keep this short, we won't create a logging framework here, we simply print the exception to the console. Now one cool thing about these exception filters is that we can put anything here that returns a boolean. If the return value here is true, then the catch block will be executed, otherwise we simply skip the catch block and the exception bubbles further up to the caller. The other cool thing is that we have access to the exception instance here. I have a log method here that prints the exception to the console and then returns false, which means that the catch block won't be executed. Basically we can observe the exception, but we don't catch it, so the caller method has to handle it or the program will terminate. And here is an other version which doesn't use an exception filter, we simply catch the exception, log it and then rethrow it. We already know that the generated IL code will be different, now let's discuss the consequence in practice. Now one very important thing to note here is that once a catch block is entered, the CLR will unwind the stack. This means that if we hit this line, then this method will be on the top of the call stack, so the method that we called in the try block simply won't be visible on the call stack. This has two implications, 
First of all, unwinding the stack costs CPU and second, it makes debugging harder since you destroyed the original call stack. Let's start with the call stack. To see the difference, I uncomment this thread sleep line in the log method. Additionally, I start a timer here which will fire after one second. So at that point, we are already in the sleep line in the log method where we observe the exception. And what we do in the timer is that we simply print the call stack of the thread where we observe the exception. Now this code isn't how you should capture a call stack. As you can see, this is actually deprecated, but for us right now, this is fine. First, I'm going to use the method with the exception filter. Let's start this. We clearly see that the main method called method A, then it called B with filter, then C, and then we are again back at B with filter, and currently we are in thread.sleep internal, which was called through the B with filter method. So we throw the exception in the C method and it is on the call stack and this is because we didn't enter the catch block here in B with filter so we didn't unwind the stack. Another good thing about this is that if we have let's say something more within the method where the exception is thrown and we simply start the debugger which breaks when we hit the throw line then we can even see the local variables here. Currently I use the default break when thrown settings so my debugger only breaks on second chance exceptions. In a more complex code, this can be extremely useful. All right, now let's call the other method that doesn't use exception filter. This is the call stack main e b with exception handler and then the log method. There is nothing here about the c method that throws the exception and this is because we entered the catch block which did unwind the stack. Let's also start the program with a debugger. As you can see with the default settings, it only breaks in the catch block when we rethrow the exception but we don't really know what happened in the C method and again, the reason for that is that as soon as we enter the catch block, the CLR unwound the call stack. Of course, you can change the settings here to also break on first chance exceptions as a workaround, but that doesn't change the fact that the catch block destroyed the original call stack. Now, one thing I would like to point out here is that the stack trace property on the exception instance always contains the same call stack so in this code, both with the b with filter and with the b with exception handler methods, the stack trace property contains the c method. Stack unwinding doesn't change that, but it changes the stack when you observe the CLR from the outside, for example with an other tool like Perfue, or when the process is dumped into a crash dump, or when you create a stack trace manually, as we do it here. In scenarios when for example the program crashes in production, a stack unwinding in a similar code can make the developer's job to figure out why the program crashes much harder. Now let's talk about the other aspect of stack unwinding, which is performance. For this, I prepared another small sample application here. It's basically the same as before. We want to log our exceptions, but we don't want to catch them. This one here is the classic catch and rethrow approach. Then here is one with an exception filter, which avoids stack unwinding. I use benchmark.net to measure the difference between the two. For this, I have two benchmark methods. One calls the solution with the filter 100 times and the other one calls the solution with the catch block and rethrow also 100 times. In both cases, we catch the exception in the benchmark method and we don't do anything with that. So in this case, we call this method and here we call the method that throws an exception. Then with this filter, we observe, but we don't catch the exception and then back in the benchmark method, we catch it. In the other case, we call this method, then this method, which throws an exception, then in the catch block, we catch it, we unwind the stack, lock the exception, then we rethrow the exception, which we catch again in the benchmark method. Now let's see the numbers. As you can see, the difference is significant. This code, of course, doesn't do anything except throws the exception. So in a real world code base, I would expect a smaller difference but this is still very significant. So let's summarize this. Since c 6, we can use exception filters and the big advantage of this feature is that it helps us to avoid entering catch blocks and with that, we can prevent stack unwinding. The positive effect of this is that every time you filter out exceptions with an exception filter, you keep the call stack as it is, which makes debugging easier and also saves performance. All right, that's it for this week. As always, you find the source code and some additional links in the description. If you liked the video, please subscribe to the channel and also hit the thumbs up button. Thanks for watching 
and next week I will explain another .NET concept.